Hey guys, this the Magic here, and the pre-release for Amon Cat is coming up, uh, I believe, next Friday night? I don't know. I'm dead tired right now, so this video is going to be a little off. But I always make a video trying to help people out, tell them how to do better at the pre-release, and this time around it looks like uh, it's going to be the luck of your pool. Very little skill, very little decision making, just, oh look, look what I pulled. But it's not just bombs, I mean, there's some other cards that you might be thinking, oh, that sounds kind of good, but I don't know. Well, in Sealed, a lot of your cards suck, a lot of them, when you draw them, you don't need them, and that sort of thing. And then removal is so few and far between, you can really get away with something. It's usually just biggest creature wins, and anything with flying basically has unblockable. So, with all of that in consideration... Um, I picked out, I don't know, a couple cards, probably like 30 or so, that I think are just absolutely amazing at the pre-release, so at Sealed. Uh, not necessarily carrying over it into draft, though. Oh, and first, I have to mention, I left out the really obvious ones, like, hey, if you pull a Planeswalker, freaking put it in your deck unless the colors are tragic. And by that, I mean the rest of the cards in that color in your pool. Also, oh, if it has cycling, yeah, it's probably good, because if you top deck it and don't need it, you can pay to ditch it and pull something else. Just be aware that you might actually run out of cards in your library, because there are only 40 cards and the games go on a ways. So first of all, Oketra the True, aka Mittens, Mittens the Kitten, uh, double strike and indestructible, 3-6 for 4. Only one of it's white. What? Can't attack or block unless you control at least three other creatures. Just make sure it's in a creature-heavy deck. And plus, it creates creatures. I mean, it can just run itself. So, I wish it cost three, but that would be a little much. I mean, six damage, come on. But this uh, cat is insane. Next up, of course, Kefnet the Mindful. Um, flying an Indestructible only costs three, only one of which is blue, and it's five damage. You can single-handedly win the game. Uh, the only thing you have to have is seven or more cards in hand, so cast just this, hoard your cards until you have eight, and then even go down to one, and just stop dropping lands, basically. You you will just win after four swings. I mean, there is very close to nothing that they can do about this card. So, if you pull Kefnet, you basically just won. Then, of course, there's Bantu the Glorified. You knew he was coming. Menace and Indestructible. That's crazy. I mean, every time you swing, you'll kill two of their creatures and have next to zero chance of him dying. Uh, he can't attack or block unless a creature died under your control this turn, but he does have pay two sack of creatures. So you would have to get a little creature heavy with him to make him work, but uh, yeah, that's it. Next up is, of course, Ronus, Death Touch Indestructible. I mean, it's a 5-5 five, five for three. Uh, and he can't attack or block unless you control another creature with power four or greater. So you're not exactly going to hit them on, you know, turn three with it necessarily. But you can pay three and another target creature gets plus two plus oh and trample. I wouldn't even swing with it, honestly, unless it would be lethal because, ta-da, you probably own a creature with power four or greater. Do this before combat. Now it's allowed to swing. So once again, five, five indestructible plus death touch. I mean, come on. That is just crazy. I mean, especially for three mana. That's nuts. Hey, where's Hazret? Not on the list because it sucks. Can't attack or block unless you have one or fewer cards in hand. I mean, okay, I'd put it in. I mean, indestructible and haste. Who honestly cares about haste? Um, if you were to top deck this super late game, yeah, you could probably swing with it. Um, you can discard a card and deal two damage. That's cool, but you don't want to burn through your cards that quick. Um, and even though it's indestructible, I don't know. I mean, like I said, I'd put it in red, but I, I wouldn't be thrilled about it. Next up, Gideon of the Trials. Okay, I said all the obvious ones wouldn't be in there. I mean, if you can guard him, great. Then throw out the emblem, you can't lose the game. Otherwise, I mean, a 4-4 indestructible? Sure, why not? For three? Okay. Big surprise here, as foretold, <laughs> you can cast eventually everything for free on your turn and your opponent's turn at like an instant on their turn anything else on your turn once eventually you're going to be into the three four five six seven cost and it's just going to get out of control this basically makes you about twice as powerful as your opponent in sealed then of course there's vizier of the menagerie or vizier i'm not really sure which the pronunciation is uh, you may look at the top card of your library, but only you. You don't have to reveal it, just you look at it. Uh, you may cast the top card of your library if it's a creature card. 
Um, then, you know, automatic color fixing. That's huge. I mean, you can bring out twice the number of creatures as your opponent. Okay, probably not mathematically, but in an all-creatures green deck with nothing but one-third lands, yeah, you could bring out a lot more creatures than them. Plus, in a multicolor deck, I mean, here's your fixing. So, plus it's a 3-4. It's pretty hard to blow up, so nothing bad about this card. Next up, Trial of Ambition. It's an enchantment, stays on the field. When it enters the battlefield, target opponent sacrifices a creature. Who cares about cartouches? It'll never happen. It's basically a kill spell. Now, it is of their choice, so that sucks, but, you know, a kill spell for two? Sure, why not? Now, next up, we do have the Cartouche of Strength. Um, enchant creature you control. It does grant plus one, plus one, and trample to the creature, which is pretty intense, and... When Cartouche of Strength enters the battlefield, you may have the creature that you enchanted uh, fight target creature and opponent controls. So basically a kill card or removal spell in green. Uh, yeah, definitely. Hand me over this uh, wonderful Cartouche, whatever the hell a Cartouche is. Oh, look, another one. Cartouche of Knowledge. Only cost two. Pretty nice. Uh, enchant creature you control when it enters battlefield draw a card so boom replaces itself immediately and the enchanter creature gets plus one plus one in flying blue creatures are kind of weak this makes them not and like i said flying is basically unblockable it replaces itself it's perfect next up angel of sanctions uh, it does cost five but when it enters battlefield exile target non-land permanent and opponent controls until it leaves plus embalm so you get a second shot at it pretty nuts it's only three damage in the air, but it can block and you can get rid of like their only flyer, their only reached creature, and then just keep hitting them until you win. So yeah, I'd put it in. It's on the top end of the curve, but I'd put it in, of course. Next up, a little bit of a controversial one here, Cruel Reality. Uh, you're probably not going to get to seven real soon, and until you do, this is a dead useless card in your hand, but enchant player, and during their upkeep, they have to sacrifice a creature or planeswalker if they can't they lose five life and they also cannot choose to lose five life. They have to sacrifice a creature at Planeswalker. This is called get to seven and win the game. So yeah, you would just about have to run 20 lands in that deck though. So whatever. Uh, next up harvest season. Oh, isn't that pretty? A mummy gardener. <laughs> it's just weird. I can't get over the weird use of mummies. Um, it's a sorcery cost three. It's green. It's rare. Uh, search your library for up to X basic land cards where X is the number of tapped creatures you control and put those cards onto the battlefield tapped. Hello. You could probably go get like four lands. Are you kidding me? I mean, just swing all out and then go get a bunch of lands and summon something huge. That card is insane. I mean, even if you don't need the mana, it just gets the lands out of your way in your deck so you can, you know, stop pulling lands and start pulling real cards. Next up, oh boy, a Sphinx, Glyph Keeper. He is a 5-3 flyer for 5. That's already pretty darn good. Also, the artwork's really good. That's really the best determining factor for playability. Um, when it becomes the target of a spell or ability for the first time each turn, counter that spell or ability. Does not work while it's on the stack, obviously. It also has Embalm 7, so you might be able to bring it back as another freaking 5-3 flyer. So they have to kill it twice, and to kill it the first time, they have to target it twice. This is basically indestructible slash hexproof. I mean, this is just crazy. Now, it's not that hard to deal them three damage, but it kind of is. They'd almost have to do it in combat. You know, otherwise they can't really target them. So, yeah, I would definitely throw that in. Uh, next up, we got Sweltering Suns. Uh, it is double red, so watch out for that in, you know, two or three color. It's also sorcery, but it deals three damage to each creature. Basically, Anger of the Gods. So, just total board wipe. And if all their creatures are too big and all yours are smaller, if you have twice as many creatures as they do, cycling three. So you have to pay three, which I thought was excessive, but whatever. Um, and discard this card, draw a better card. Ta-da. Next up is Honored Hydra. Pretty freaky looking uh, fellow there. Um, it's just a 6-6 six, six with Trample. You gotta pay six to get it out the first time, and hello, Trample, just swing with it every turn because it has Embalm four. So bring it back second time, keep on swinging. I mean, you're going to do so much damage. Next up, no surprise here, the number one most expensive rare in the set, Harsh Mentor. Whenever an opponent activates an ability of an artifact, creature, or land on the battlefield, if it isn't a mana ability, Harsh Mentor deals two damage to that player. May or may not happen in a game, but he's a 2-2 two -two for two. So even if you never get his ability to go off, no problem. But if you do, holy crap, can that damage pile up. Just do not miss the trigger. Next up is, of course, Prowling Serpapard. 
Uh, it can't be countered, and creature spells you control can't be countered. That's kind of cool, kind of nice. I mean, how many counter spells could they possibly pull? There's like three in the entire set, I think. Um, but it's a 4-3. It's a 4-3 for three. I mean, it is double green, so watch out for that. If you're going mixed color, eh, I don't know. But four attack for three mana, that's not bad. Next up, duh, Champion of Ronus. <laughs> you can exert it when you do. Take anything from your hand that's a creature and drop it onto the battlefield for free. Holy crap. I mean, this is going to be insane and constructed. It's only pretty good at the pre-release and sealed. I mean, you might be dropping in like a 2-2 two -two or something. I mean, at least you didn't have to pay for it, but, you know, whatever. And you could only exert every other turn, obviously. Uh, there's no way to just plan your deck to have Vigilance. But, I mean, if you got out like a 7 cost for free one time and won the game because of it, yeah. Plus, it's a 3-3 three -three for 4. That's not, like, tragic. Next up, we got a pretty wild creature here, Channeler Initiate. It's a 3-4 for 2, but it enters the battlefield with 3 negative 1, negative 1 counters on, well, on target creature you control. So, the idea is you'd probably put it on Channeler Initiate, but not necessarily. Um, it's not going to be terribly useful if you don't. You also, strangely, cannot split them. So, like I said, you're probably going to put it on her. Now, you do have to control the creature that you choose, so you could just outright kill one and, oh, look, you've got a 3-4, ignore the ability. Otherwise, uh, you tap, remove a 1-1 one, one counter from channel or initiate, colon, that's part of the cost. If you can't do it, you can't uh, use the ability. Add one mana of any color to mana pool. So that's pretty cool. The only problem is you'd almost have to use this instead of land until it gets really big, but every time that you tap it, you're not hitting them, so you're losing out on damage to make it do more damage in the future. So, not ideal, but it is color fixing, and it is a 3-4 for 2, so not bad. Just keep in mind, you could drop the 3 one, one counters on a 1-1 one, one zombie token that you control, and then just start swinging with the 3-4. Next up, we got a wild spell out of blue. Open into wonder. It's double blue and then X. X target creatures can't be blocked this turn. Hello. Until end of turn, those creatures gain. Whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. So unblockable and draw a card. You'd probably only have to put this on like two or three creatures. You can single-handedly win the game by making them unblockable. And if you don't, you just drew two or three cards. I mean, th this is an insane card. Next up, Devoted Crop Mate. Um, he costs three. He's white, human warrior. Uh, you may exert Devoted Crop Mate as it attacks. When you do, return target creature card with converted mana cost two or less from your graveyard straight to the battlefield. So if they keep killing something other than him, just keep exerting him. Now, it doesn't make him any bigger. He's only 3-2. He's probably going to die. But you could bring back something with like an ETB effect or something just really good. So it's definitely worth it. It's like an undo button for one of their kill spells, and kill spells are few and far between. So this might win you the game. Next up, Baleful Amit. I have no idea what the hell that is. It looks like a crocolion. Um, it's a 4-3 with lifelink for 3. I mean, hello. Uh, when it enters the battlefield, put a negative one, negative one counter on target creature you control. Even if you put it on him, no big deal. Put it on some garbage creature, who cares? Put it on a big flyer, whatever. I mean, four lifelink? Four lifelink. Four lifelink on turn three. I don't even care what an Emmet is at this point. I want one. Oh, it's a crocodile demon. I wasn't far off. Next up, possibly one of the most annoying uncommons, Ruthless Sniper. It's a one, two for one, which is already pretty darn good. And um, whenever you cycle or discard a card, which, you know, okay, might happen, uh, you may pay one. If you do, put a negative one, negative one counter on target creature. This by itself could kill multiple creatures. I mean, it's that good. Either that or much, much, much more likely, you'll take a combat standoff and turn it into I'm swinging. If your creatures are even one point bigger on attack or defense, guess what? You're swinging. That is just how pre-release works, so if you could get this to go off a couple times, hello. Next up, very cool card, Bone Picker. This is a 3-2 Flying Death Toucher, which is already worth 4, but it only costs 1 to cast if a creature died this turn. I guarantee you can get a creature to die, just swing into something, I mean, whatever. This would be especially good if you have Death Touchers. It's in the air, it's powerful, it's Death Touch, I mean, this card's insane. 
Next up, Blood Rage Brawler. It's a 4-3 for 2. What? When it enters the battlefield, discard a card. Who cares? You didn't need that card anyway. It's probably a land or just some irrelevant garbage. You really do not need about one-third of your cards at any given time in the average uh, sealed game. So, yeah, no big problem. I mean, it's a freaking 4-3 for 2. Next up, the creepy-looking Grim Strider, a.k.a. Slenderman. Uh, it's a 6-6 six, six for 4, and it gets negative 1, negative 1 for each card in your hand. So, if you get him out late enough, cool. If you got him out early and it's like minus 4, minus 4, okay, at least you got a 2-2 two, two body on the field. Um, this is basically a really pathetic Nixithid and an even worse um, Garrow's Masterpiece. It's not even flying. It's not blue. I mean, it's it's just not that great. But, like I said, if you got a 6-6 six, six for 4... And it's full blast. I mean, hey, even if you shrink it to a five or four, that ain't bad. Next up, one of the most overlooked, underrated cards. Okay, Consuming Fervor. Enchant creature for one, and it gets plus three, plus three. Almost forever. At the beginning of your upkeep, whether you swung with it or dealt damage or not, put a negative one, negative one counter on this creature. So you would do three extra damage, then two extra damage, then one extra damage, then dead even, and then it stands a risk of dying. Guess what? That's six extra damage for one red. Six damage, one red. Yes, please. Next up, a hyper important card, depending upon your deck. Sixth Sense. God, I could never say that. Good movie, though. Um, Enchant Creature, for one. Enchanted Creature has whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, you may draw a card. It's Bident of Thassa. Okay, Rogue's Gloves is probably a more appropriate comparison. Actually, I think there's a green enchantment that already does something just like this. Th this might even be a reprint. I don't even know. Oh, wait, no. I think it was blue, and I think you drew one, the discarded one. Whatever. But, uh, yeah. You want to draw cards passively, repeatedly. I mean, this could draw you, like, six cards in a game for one. Yes, absolutely put this in as not a wasted spot in your deck. Next up, True Heart Duelist. Uh, cost two. It's a 2-2, two -two, so it's already pretty good. Um, it can block an additional creature each combat, and you can bring it back for three. So... Um, it'll allow you to swing with something better and not worry about getting counterstruck because you could uh, just block, get it killed, bring it back, block, get it killed again, and that's it. That's just good. I mean, it's not great, but it's good. Uh, next up, Synchronized Strike. Uh, I love this one because it's basically a green removal spell because it's ambush. So um, it costs three, which, you know, that's reasonable and sealed. Untap up to two target creatures, so they're swinging away, you have no blockers, boom, untap them, they each get plus two, plus two till end of turn. Now the other thing is, cast this before or during combat, doesn't really matter, probably, you know, right after you declare them as attackers so that they untap, and they're still attacking, and they still get plus two, plus two. You can use this to ambush your opponent on attacking or blocking, or just to outright finish them, just to kill them, I mean, it's four extra damage. Next up, Emberhorn Minotaur. It's a 4-3 for 4. You may exert it. When you do, it gets plus 1, plus 1 in Menace until end of turn, so that's 5 damage. Potentially unblockable for 4. Um, only every other turn, but, I mean, you swing twice, you might win the game. So, it's definitely good enough to put in. The next card is Illusory Wrappings. I like a lot of the Illusion cards so far. They're kind of cool. Um, you enchant creature for 3. Enchanted creature has base, power, and toughness 0-2. In other words, it's basically almost a kill spell in blue. So if you're playing blue, great, you're not going to have any kill spells. This basically removes a creature. So if they had a 6-6 six, six flyer, they now have a 0-2 flyer. They're probably just going to block, get it killed, and then this will end up in your graveyard. But, you know, that's fine. You know, killed the creature, didn't it? Next up, it's Shambling Goblin. I mean, Festering Mummy. Um, it's a 1-1 one, one for 1 in black, and when it dies, you may put a negative 1, negative 1 counter on target creature. Okay, so it's actually better than uh, uh, Shambling Goblin. That's either guaranteed 1 damage, or a potential kill spell, or a potential, um, uh, what would you call it? Like, battlefield evener, I guess you could say. Next, we got Bitterblade Warrior. It's a 2-2 two, two for 2. In green, you may exert it when it attacks. When you do, it gains plus 1 and death touch until end of turn. So, there you go. There's your, you know, it doesn't always have death touch, but if I want, I can make it have it. Not as a surprise, though. But 3 damage for 2 is already pretty darn good. And they would have to um, block with quite a bit if you were to grant it trample. So, it's just good. I mean, it's just, oh, they, they want to block with a 7-7? Great. The only problem is you can't activate it on defense. Still a good creature, though. 
Next up, a reprint. Brute Strength. Uh, plus three, plus one, and Trample. Simple, simple. Only cost two. It'll kill anything in its way, and instead of just ambushing it, you'll also probably deal damage to your opponent. So, even if your creature doesn't live, this is a damn good spell. Next up, Slitherblade. It's a 1-2 for 1, and it can't be blocked. Do not underestimate this. This is Triton Shorestalker, but improved. I mean, can you believe that? Like, that card was hot, even with the ordeals. I mean, okay. But if you were to boost this guy, you could just win the game with them. And if you bring him out on turn one, for the rest of the game, you're going to deal one damage. I mean, and then the best thing is he's a total lightning rod. And he's a one, two for one. He isn't even worth a removal spell. But they're going to lose the game if they don't remove him. I mean, okay, in 20 turns, but you're probably swinging with other stuff too. And like I said, if you manage to boost it or, you know, grant it a temporary boost or double strike or any of that, oh my gosh. I can almost guarantee I'm going to build a standard deck with this guy in it where I get him up to 20. Anyway, Naga Vitalist is the next one. Uh, it's a 1-2 two for 2, and you can tap it and add any mana to your mana pool for a type... Okay, wait, I already screwed this up. I'm going to read it exactly as it is. Add to your mana pool one mana of any type that a land you control could produce. In other words, it's reflecting pool in creature form. Reflecting pools have been going up and up and up in price lately because people are realizing it's really quite good in modern. Uh, so yeah, throw this in. If, if it's multicolor, throw it in. Simple. It's really damn good fixing. Next up, Supernatural Stamina. You guys know I love to ambush. Simple, simple. Until end of turn, target creature gets plus two attack and gains. When this creature dies, return it to the battlefield tapped under its owner's control. So you get to kill something and you get your creature back. It might as well be plus two and indestructible because it's, well, just about the same thing. For one, speaking of awesome creepy Minotaur art, Cursed Minotaur, it's a 3-2 three, for three with Menace. I mean, if, they're, if they want to block this, they're probably going to lose two creatures, even without Ambush. So, uh, they're at least going to lose one creature, probably. I mean, come on, three attack. And once again, it's sort of unblockable, maybe. Uh, and if you manage to boost it, you could win with it. I mean, it's just that good by itself. Next up, Sacred Kete. It's a 1-1 one, one for 1 with Lifelink. But it has Embalm, so not only are you going to swing with it every single turn until it dies and gain one life the whole time, which is very valuable, um, you're going to bring it back once. Then you get lifelink with the Zombie Kitty. Do not underestimate this sheer volume of life you're going to gain off this, or its ability to jump block. Now we're getting into the weird stuff. Never to return. You gotta add the word to in between these. Um, destroy target creature or planeswalker as a sorcery for three. Yep, it's a kill spell. I mean, that's really all you need to know about it. What does return do? Who cares? Uh, next up, we've got insult to injury. This is insane. This is, this is just stupid. This card is going to be so broken. Um, you pay three. Damage can't be prevented this turn. Okay, whatever. Um, there's like one fog card or something. If a source you control would deal damage this turn, it deals double that damage instead. Or as I like to call it, pay three, win the game. What does injury do? Nothing good. Who cares? Uh, destined to lead. Target creature gets plus one plus O oh, and gains indestructible until end of turn. I mean, as an instant, it's an ambush. You might kill them. I mean, plus one is pretty narrow. You can at least save one of your creatures. It's just good. What does lead do? Who cares? Not even on color. Onward to victory. This is insane. This is this is probably even worse than the other red one. Target creature gains plus X power until end of turn, where X is its power. So in other words, it doubles its power. What the hell? This one is not on color, but I will read it. Victory. Target creature gains double strike until end of turn. What? So if you can generate one single white and then pull off the other two, you're going to do double damage again. The best thing is if you got six mana, you can cast this and then immediately cast it again from your graveyard if it isn't the middle of combat. Yeah, quadruple damage. It's time to prepare to fight. Untapped target creature gets plus two, plus two, and lifelink until end of turn. I mean, I don't even need to say why that's good. What does fight do? Who cares? Okay, it makes two creatures fight, duh. Um, then we got Oketra's Monument. Um, pretty much one of the only monuments I would bother to put out. Now, here's the thing. It's colorless. So, anybody can throw this in their deck. White creature spells you cast cost one less. Whatever, who cares? Even if you're not running white, who cares? 
but whenever you cast a creature spell, not just a white creature spell, any creature spell, create a 1-1 one, one white warrior creature, creature token with vigilance. So, hello. I mean, every time you get a creature, you actually get two creatures. Yeah, the other one's a crappy little 1-1, one, one, but, I mean, unlimited tokens. Okay, not quite unlimited, but you get what I mean. I mean, you're going to have one hell of a board state. So I cannot stress this enough. Put this in your deck if you draw it. I don't care if you're running white. It doesn't matter. Next up, interesting card, Luxa River Shrine. Uh, three cost, universal. That's always fun. You pay one and gain one life. Put a brick counter on Luxa River Shrine. So you got to tap it, but I mean, do that once a turn. Hello, it's like having lifelink. And here's where it gets nuts. You can just outright tap it gain two life, activate this ability only if there are three more brick counters on it. So once you get to three, you don't have to pay for it, and you gain double. This card is out of control. I mean, in standard, you can play around it. I mean, if you got a superior board state, oh no, you just swing one additional time and give them one additional turn. No big deal. But um, in limited, I mean, get this out on turn three, wow. You are going to be swimming in life. They're going to have to just about kill you twice. And the final card that I have determined to be very, very, very good in Sealed, Honed Kapish. It might be Kopesh, I don't know, I don't speak Egyptian. Also, honestly, that really doesn't even look like one. But Equip Creature gets plus one, plus one. It costs one to get out, it costs one to equip. It's like a 1-1 one, one boost to your creatures that never goes away all game. Because if they kill the creature, first of all, probably just bring back the creature with Embalm. And secondly, just put it on a different creature. So it's just good. I mean, equipment is always really, really, really good. So that's it. I know it was a bit of a long list, but, um, you know, the good news is it's all over the place. Um, I'd say maybe blue was extremely lacking. I think only four of the cards I said, no, five of the cards were blue. It's not very good. And honestly, those blue cards weren't very good except for as foretold. So once again, blue's kind of weak at the pre-release. What else is, you know, new? I've played blue at almost every pre-release ever, so I probably still will. But, um, yeah, you can see how these would be powerful. I gave the examples, the situations, and uh, hopefully now you can just spot the pretty much two colors in your pool uh, that have the most powerful cards and then play that. Uh, I think it'll be a little bit hard to pull off three color. I usually don't stretch it because there are certain games where you'll just sit there and just do nothing. I mean, you'll just be waiting forever for, like, your red mana, and you'll just be holding red cards. It'll just self-destruct and you just lost the game without even getting to play Magic. So do not push it. I would definitely limit it to two. Unless you've got like three different color fixers in your deck. Now if you do have three different color fixers, just add the best of of three colors. I mean, hell yeah, why not? So hopefully you guys do well at the pre-release and I'll see you guys next video.